So um, I'm going to tell you guys three examples today about uh, some work that's being done um, by my group, by our partners, um, uh, by my company, Catalytic Innovations, um, how we're bringing technology that's used for artificial photosynthesis or solar fuels into the real world and applying that um, in different applications that are not trying to displace fossil fuels. Um, and the biggest, the biggest reason why we're doing that is in the end to actually displace fossil fuels. Uh, our, our biggest problem, in my opinion at least globally, is, is climate change. And a close, uh, a close second to that is the fact that we can't store renewable energy to utilize it um, on a larger scale to fight climate, climate change. Um, and thousands of researchers around the globe are looking into ways to store renewable energy in chemical bonds. And uh, the example that I use right over here is uh, making uh, sugar by carbon dioxide reduction and water oxidation because that's really close to what plants do. Um, but making this reaction happen on a, on a large scale is really tough. And the biggest challenge um, is competing with fossil fuels. Uh, the targets, when you're trying to make hydrogen, for example, from water splitting, which is a, the simpler reaction compared to carbon dioxide reduction, the, the targets that we have for the cost of hydrogen from water splitting are even the, the eventual targets, you know, 10, 20 years down the road are still way more expensive than anything that we can get from fossil fuels today. And that's also assuming that we don't get better at getting things from fossil fuels, which we are also getting better at. Um, on top of that, we've been looking for an all-in-one device that can convert sunlight into chemical energy, uh, so an artificial leaf um, that can do that in a cost-competitive way with fossil fuels. Uh, since the initial discoveries of, uh, of this field um, in 1972 and in 1986, and we have not really made it there. However, we have made it to the point where we can commercialize discrete components of that technology, and we can make money in the short term, which helps to you know, fund further research. Uh, but more importantly, we can demonstrate that this research is valuable, economically valuable, in a climate where you really have to make justification uh, for scientific research. And that's sad, I don't like that. I like doing science for the sake of science. But um, the fact of the matter is, in the current political climate and uh, around the world, uh, people want to see tangible economic results from science. And so that's where, um, that's where my company comes in. So uh, the biggest advantages that commercializing these sorts of technologies early can do um, is mitigating risk for the individual components prior to integrating them in an integrated device. Um, it can also give us an opportunity to just innovate in this field in a way that can be implemented on commercial scales. Um, and what's most important, to me at least, is being able to do this without depending on a government policy or a government subsidy. So having technology that is economically advantageous of its own right. Uh, now, this all kind of sounds nebulous, but to give you guys some more specific solid examples um, that I'm going to go into more detail on in just a few slides, you can take water oxidation catalysts and apply them to things that are not necessarily focused on water oxidation. You're not necessarily trying to get protons and electrons to make a chemical fuel, uh, but you're trying to get protons and electrons to do something else, like for example, when you're refining zinc. Hydrogen evolution, that, that catalytic process, which we study a lot for water splitting for solar fuels, can be applied to wastewater treatment. Carbon dioxide reduction can be applied to producing cleaner products than you can get from other um, non-CO2 reduction, direct CO2 reduction sources. And the whole idea behind this, other than to make money in the short term, because, I mean, I'm a startup company, so uh, that's important to make money. Um, the, the, real, the real motivation behind this scientifically, though, is to build a foundation for these technologies for the future, future adaptation of integrated devices that can then make solar fuels uh, a, a stronger reality. And uh, the bottom reference that you'll see a few times in this, uh, in this presentation um, is, a, is a perspective on this um, with my company, uh, the Solar Fuels Institute, and, and, a, and uh, a partner company that we recently published in the journal Chem. So please feel free to look that up if this sounds interesting to you. 
but on to the actual science. Um, I mentioned that you can take a water oxidation catalyst and use that in metal refining. So who here knows how zinc is made? Show of hands. This is also a test to see who's awake. <laughs> um, zinc is made by taking zinc ore, dissolving it in a high molarity sulfuric acid, about 1.62 molar, taking a aluminum cathode and a lead anode, dunking them in that soup, and applying about a three and a half volt potential between the anode and the cathode, plating the zinc on the aluminum cathode and evolving oxygen on the lead anode, evolving oxygen on the lead anode. So it's doing water oxidation. Um, now, how do we take a water oxidation catalyst and apply it to this? Um, and that, that, this was the result of hundreds of interviews in the NSF i -Corps program that I did shortly after graduate school. Um, we have to find a place where they need one. And they do have a pain point in lead anode corrosion. Um, so when, when you're out, uh, evolving oxygen on a lead anode, you can get soluble lead species um, that will, you know, high oxidation state lead species that will solubilize into the solution and then contaminate your, your zinc product and put lead in your wastewater. And all of those things are things that you don't necessarily want if you're a zinc refinery being looked at very closely by people like the EPA. You can put a water oxidation catalyst on the surface of these lead anodes to act as a whole sink. So the holes will go toward the water oxidation catalyst because the activation barrier is lower to, for water oxidation on the water oxidation catalyst. And the way that I got to this and the way that my coworkers got to this is a little bit unique. So think of a chemical reaction uh, in the typical way you see it. You, you, you have your reactants, you have your intermediates, and then you have your desired product. Now, chemical reactions never really, I mean, very rarely look like this. Usually they look more like this. And you can go in a variety of different directions, and there's only one desired product you usually want, but you, you, there's, a, there's a million different ways that you can get to other things. Catalysts are used to lower the activation barrier for that direction to get, your, to get to your desired product. Inhibitors stop all of the other reactions from happening. So, I mean, really, if you're, if you're doing, it's like half, half dozen of one, six of the other, really with catalysts and inhibitors for a lot of these industrial processes, you're talking about the same sort of end effect. So we applied this to, um, and really, when I tried to, when I walked into, you know, a zinc plant and said, I want to sell you guys a water oxidation catalyst, they said, a water oxidation what? And then, you know, after a little bit of rebranding, I said, I want to sell you guys a corrosion resistant layer. And they said, well, buy it. But the way it works is, I mean, electrochemically, you can see the way it works. If in a cyclic voltammogram, we vary the potential and measure the current that we get out of the anode. The way that it works is really taking the, the redox features that are, uh, that are representative of lead solubility, for example, lead 3,4 redox couple, and when you put an iridium catalyst on that anode, that redox feature goes away. So the redox feature that shows you're making a soluble lead species goes away. And on longer term experiments, you can show that it actually does have an effect in reducing the corrosion of the anode. And this is something that we have implemented on a, on a decent scale. The second example, we don't really have implement, implemented on a decent scale, but it's something that we're working on. So instead of using the typical uh, kind of solar fuels formula, we decided that we wanted to remediate a liquid waste stream by turning that into hydrogen gas rather than um, oxidizing water because it's easier to oxidize the organic contaminants. So uh, what we did um, was, uh, and the value proposition for this technology is uh, you find you're, you're not making money off the hydrogen, you're making money off of removing the contaminants in the water. And so what we did is uh, we applied this to, um, I don't know if you guys have ever eaten Greek yogurt, when you open it, there's that little soupy stuff that's a little bit sour on the top of it. Well, you make about, um, you make a lot more of that than you make Greek yogurt, and it's a big environmental problem. Um, and so we built a pilot system to remove the lactic acid from that, that acidy stuff, the acid whey. Um, and we were able to, uh, to actually find this whole research direction out by, by, by losing uh, a feature in cyclic voltammograms when you try to, when you try to measure um, redox properties in those lactic acid solutions. And uh, we did a lot of research on uh, mechanistic work and trying to find out which catalysts are best for this process. Uh, that's another one that, uh, in, in the rare instance that a startup company publishes a paper, um, we, uh, we, we did do a little bit of talking about this. So that's something that you can look up as well. Um, 
The last example that I'm going to give you guys is, uh, is one that we currently have working on a decent scale and where it's going to be um, it's going to be coming out pretty soon, and there's a little bit of, uh, I think there was a little bit of uh, formatting error there, but that's the, uh, um, that's two carbon dioxide plus three waters goes to ethanol and three oxygen uh, gas mo uh, molecules. Um, we built a prototype that uh, reduces carbon dioxide into primarily ethanol. Um, and one advantage that you have when you're doing carbon dioxide uh, reduction is that you make smaller molecules in general. It's tougher to make the longer chain hydrocarbons with carbon dioxide reduction. It's also tougher to remove the longer chain hydrocarbons when you're trying to purify an ethanol stream. So we can make a clean, high purity ethanol product out of carbon dioxide reduction a little bit more easily than you can removing the amyl alcohols from fermentation. If you look at the economics of this for high purity ethanol production, it actually looks pretty great. If you look at the economics of this for low purity alcohol production that you're burning in a, in a car, it's a little bit more difficult. But if you look at this for high purity ethanol production, you can actually make some money with it. Um, and we, uh, we got some early validation from uh, Mass Challenge Israel, and uh, we won the United Nations, uh, one of their biggest awards toward achieving their 17 sustainable development goals uh, in a startup, their Ideas for Change Award. And uh, I think a part of that was because I brought some of that high purity ethanol. Uh, you can see a little bottle there. Um, and that, that might have helped the judging process a little bit. Uh, it was diluted with water to roughly 40% alcohol by volume. Uh, and then at the very end here, and hopefully I haven't gone too much over time, um, after talking about that 17% on our, on our little pie chart of uh, what sort of drink fuels us. Um, uh, the most important thing to me is uh, my team and the acknowledgments that uh, for the people that have worked with me on this. And I, uh, in a startup, you can't do everything alone. Um, and I have two excellent um, uh, full-time employees that uh, full-time PhDs that uh, do a lot of the research with me. Um, have a very uh, strong support system based at uh, Yale University, where I did my PhD and beyond. Um, and. Uh, have to specifically mention Dick Co, Amanda Smee, uh, Atasha Cave, Kendra Cool, and Nicholas Flanders, who were my co-authors on that uh, paper in chem that I encourage you all to take a look at.